The latest COVID-19 variant is spreading fast across many countries. The World Health Organization says it doesn't pose a serious threat, but with the pandemic still fresh in our minds, is there cause for worry? And will this virus ever go away? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. It is no longer a global health emergency, but COVID-19 is still a threat. That's according to the World Health Organization, which is now monitoring a new variant called EG5. It's not necessarily more dangerous than other variants, but it is spreading fast across several countries. From the US to Japan and China, the strain appears to be highly transmissible. So is COVID-19 here to stay? And with so many variants constantly emerging, will booster shots even make a difference? We'll explore these questions with our guests in just a moment. But first, this report from Katia lopez Horia. It's a new COVID-19 variant that's spreading fast. It's called the EG5, and the World Health Organization is keeping an eye on it. The virus continues to circulate in all countries, continues to kill, and it continues to change. WHO is currently tracking several variants, including EG.5, for which we are publishing a risk evaluation. For now, health experts say the EG5 strain doesn't appear to pose a higher threat than other variants like Omicron. But cases are on the rise, particularly in China, South Korea, Japan, Canada and the U.S. With new variants emerging, booster vaccines must also change. We try to uh, select the antigen uh, that uh, will um, uh, provide this uh, maximum breadth of immunity uh, so that the protection to people is uh, as uh, wide as possible, uh, anticipating that the virus may evolve uh, between the time where the recommendation is issued and the time when the vaccine is produced. EG5 is causing about 17 percent of new COVID-19 cases in the U.S., with schools back in session and summer travel possibly fueling the risk. But on a global level, the WHO says it's struggling to keep accurate statistics, with only 25 percent of countries still reporting COVID-19 data. We don't detect a change in severity of EG.5 compared to other sublineages of Omicron that have been in circulation since late 2021. The world is still recovering from the aftermath of the devastating pandemic. Nearly 7 million people have died globally since COVID-19 first emerged in 2020. It's no longer a pandemic, but the WHO says it's a mistake for governments to see the virus as something of the past. Katia lopez Odoyan for Inside Story. So there you have it. Let's bring in our guests now. In Cheshire, we have Paul Hunter in the UK, an epidemiologist and professor in medicine at the University of East Anglia. In Paris, in France, Oksana Pejek, a global health advisor and a global engagement lecturer at the University College of London School of Pharmacy. And in Mumbai, Dr. Ishwar Gelada, consultant on infectious diseases and president emeritus of the AIDS Society of India. A warm welcome to each of you. Uh, and Oksana, if I could start with you, straight to the bottom line, should we be worried, do you think? Well, I think this is certainly not the time to let our guard up, but it's important to stress that the overall risk globally is low. We are not in the same position as we were even in December 2022 with the Omicron wave, uh, but not all countries are uh, surveying as much as they can be, and we need to get that booster program rolling out that is a more specific vaccine for this um, variant of interest. So uh, what I'm really concerned about are the is the vulnerable population. Uh, we should certainly not let our guard down. Uh, but there is also not a reason for, for panic, as the WHO has uh, assessed the risk globally to be low. Right. Uh, issues over data collection you're alluding to there, which we'll come on to uh, in a moment or two. But first, Paul Hunter, the WHO described EG5 as a variant of interest. What do they mean by that? Well, uh, they 
classify new variants as variants of interest, variants of concern. A variant of concern yeah. is uh, a variant that's circulating that they are uh, worried about that is likely to cause uh, increased harm in the future. Variant of interest is basically they haven't finally made up their minds of it, but they're watching it and collecting evidence before they uh, decide uh, what to do. Most variants of interests never make it towards variants of concern, but clearly some have done in the past. So one to watch. So why is it then that in this case there is more interest around the world, more coverage about uh, EG5 and what's happening with the spread? I, I'm not sure. I mean, we've been seeing new variants every three to four months um, that have spread. Typically, uh, they're associated with a, uh, an increase in cases locally for a, uh, a few weeks before then uh, dying back down to be ultimately replaced by another new variant. So uh, I don't see this variant as being any different to many of the other variants that we've seen in, in, uh, in the last year or so. And what we have seen is with each wave of infections, uh, certainly in, in the English data, which is still pretty reasonable, that each subsequent wave is less harmful, puts fewer people in hospital, kills fewer people than the previous wave. So you know, this is a virus that's going to be around forever. We know the other human coronaviruses throw off new variants called escape variants, variants that can bypass to a certain extent prior immunity. And, the, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 is following that pattern. Uh, Dr. Gilardesh, well, Gilardo, what's your sense about this? Are you seeing much of EG5 yet in India? No, in India, we have notified only one case of EG5. Mm -hmm. According to me, we should not give much of a credence to uh, this uh, ARIS or uh, EG, EG.5. Uh, if you look at WHO's system, they have a variant of uh, uh, monitoring, variant uh, under monitoring, VUM, then variant of interest, then variant of concern, and then variant of high consequence. Now, if you look at last 21 months, we did not get any new variant after Omicron. And whatever, though they call it variant, it's a sub-sub-variant. It's a variant of XBB uh, 1.9.2, and which is a sub-variant of uh, Omicron. So after Omicron, Sorry, we when did you, not so get Can I just jump in there for a second? Just those, those numbers you're quoting there. Just explain for our viewers, if you would, what you mean by that. It, 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 you're differentiating between different variants there, are you? You see, uh, we had uh, one was a wild-type virus, which was a Wuhan virus. After that, we had alpha, beta, delta, gamma. And after that, one uh, epsilon came, but that was found not a variant of uh, any concern. And then Omicron. Omicron is a fifth variant. After Omicron, there is no new variant. This uh, Omicron uh, got changed into XBB, XBB 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.2. And this uh, current ARIS or EG.5 is a subvariant of XBB. So it is part of Omicron family only. Since beginning, I've been calling. Omicron is a variant of support, at least for India. Only after Omicron came, India opened up. Economy opened up. Socialization opened up. Education, school, colleges, business, uh, traffic, airline, everything opened up. And thereafter, there has been no looking back. So if we, we, we should look at trajectory of infection. Only having new infection it should not give us concern. A trajectory is decided by five things. Number one, how many people require oxygen? Number two, how many people require bed? Number three, how many people require ICU? Number four, how many people require ventilator? And number five, how many people die? So if the deaths and all other four parameters are low, low, and low, I don't think we should be concerned at all. It is currently much, much less uh, prevalent and much less uh, dangerous than other flu viruses, which yeah, are influenza okay. A and B. All so right, I think that's interesting. We are not giving uh, let me just let me. Uh, we'll come back to you in a second. We'll come back to you in a second, Ishwa. Uh, but yeah. Oksana, the point is though that people looking in from the outside would say that it is spreading faster than other variants have that have gone before, isn't it? 
Yeah, so we've seen successive waves of Omicron. So that's subvariants. So that's uh, the XBB uh, reference uh, that our colleague just made. Um, and that's been the pattern for the last 18 months now. But in certain regions, we see that rate of hospitalization um, going up and increasing, New York being one area um, in the UK as well, that's creeping back up again. So uh, there's going to be potentially going into the fall with RSV and other flu uh, viruses, respiratory viruses, that could put a lot of strain on the health system. So I think there's there, there are concerns um, amongst leaders of healthcare systems and hospitals about how this could affect if that wave continues, particularly as uh, quite soon uh, children will be back in school and our booster programs are not um, fully ready. Uh, Paul Hunter in Cheshire, you're an epidemiologist. Uh, I can see you want to jump in there. Yeah, I think what we have seen, uh, comparing the rate of growth in relationship to other variants recently, the EG.5 isn't actually taking over as rapidly as, say, some of the other sub-variants of Omicron that we've seen over the last year. So it is, it is still increasing. It probably will lead to some increased cases. The hospitalisation rate at the moment has been going up in the UK since early January, and, and I don't think we can blame EG.5 for that. What It's been increasing anyway, possibly because um, of uh, overseas foreign travel, which is, is a known risk factor, but also, I think, because you know, this is a virus that immunity against infection is very short-lived, whether it's from vaccine or from a natural infection. By about four or five months after an infection or a vaccine, about half the people have lost their immunity anyway. And so you are going to see these waves of, uh, of, of infections that gradually get less in terms of the severity. And I think that's what, we've, that's what we were expecting about two years ago, and that's essentially what we've seen. EG.5 will probably lead to more cases, and as cases rise, there will be some increase in hospitalizations. But at the moment in England, we've, we've come from a point at the beginning of July where we've had fewer people in hospital from, because of COVID than we've had really since the very first weeks of the, of the pandemic. And uh, so we, although cases, hospitalizations have gone up, they've gone up from a very low base. And there is some evidence that that's, that's already beginning to plateau. Ishwa, so, so with more cases, I mean, we say you say it's not one particularly to worry about this one, but if we're getting more and more cases, for those who are vulnerable, particularly vulnerable to COVID, uh, it, it does present a big problem, doesn't it? Especially the elderly. You see, wherever they're vulnerable, they're only senior citizens and people with comorbidities. And senior citizen people with comorbidities always will have some or the other problem. So they may get anything and everything, and we should look after them even otherwise. So apart from that, there is no matter of concern anywhere. Even if there will be some cases, even 70% of or 17% increase, that is one sixth of the cases are currently areas uh, globally, but it is not causing any problem. Now you look after two things. One number one, we have a hybrid immunity. Hybrid immunity is a natural immunity because of infection and vaccine. Even though the vaccine immunity has waning, been waning, we have a memory cell. And memory cells get activated when a same virus or similar viruses attack again. And this has only one mutation apart from the uh, XBB family. So with one evade, uh, mutation, it can evade some immunity, but it is not causing any problem. And so long as not causing any problem, we should not be worried. I call it, uh, it is, EG is an employment guarantee for some people. If you are uh, uh, talking about some viruses, you are employed always. We should come out of that. We should come out of the COVID-centric policies anywhere in the world. Uh, Paul, can I just come back to you for a second? Uh, tell us a little bit more about how these viruses evolve and what the process is and, and how they reinvent themselves and why, when you say that actually slowly the, the kind of the potency of COVID uh, is, is diminishing as time goes on. Why is that the case? Why doesn't it increase? Well, the the, the uh, potency is, is, the virus itself probably is no less potent. I think what, it, what we have got is, is immunity. And there's two, essentially, 
there's two types of immunity that we can talk about. There's the immunity that stops infection, the sterilized, uh, or some people call it sterilizing immunity, that, um, and then there's the immunity that prevents severe disease. Now, immunity that stops infection is fairly short lasting, even without the appearance of new uh, variants. And what we see is with most of the new variants, the mutations are primarily in the areas that, um, uh, that the body targets to cause sterilizing immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, immune systemic immunity, immunity to uh, whole body infections is much more durable. It's caused by a lot of the things other than the uh, short-lived immunity to infection. And um, uh, T cells, uh, non-neutralizing antibodies, killer cells, all of these work together. And we know that although after an infection or after vaccination, immunity, sterilizing immunity is fairly short-lived, immunity to severe disease, hospitalization requiring oxygen death, is much more durable. And it's particularly durable if you've had both vaccine and you've had um, an infection, and that's called hybrid immunity. So it's quite natural. We can expect we're going to see waves of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections mm -hmm. for forever, you know. And but the severity, the, the pressure on hospitals will undoubtedly get continue to get less and less, as it has done over the last, uh, well, really since the first Omicron wave. Right. So, so vaccines still important, still need to play a role in all of this. Oksana, uh, will we will people need boosters to deal with? EG.5 and any forthcoming variants? Well, there have been recommendations for the new booster to be um, uh, tailored to the Omicron uh, subvariants and not to include the original uh, wild virus um, because that has not been in circulation for so long. So that has been the recommendation um, that has come forth uh, to the FDA. However, uh, it will be important for those timings, uh, especially for the vulnerable. Uh, we're looking at people who are immunocompromised, elderly people, even pregnant women who are at higher clinical risk to get a booster shot. But that booster shot should be an updated version, not the ones that we've had in circulation previously. So um, this does not seem to be on track to be ready for September in the States. I think there's a bit of a delay um, before it gets out in October, but I think the timing also matters. But also to, to highlight my colleague's point, uh, this will be a process in which um, the modification and the tweaking of the boosters for certain populations will be an ongoing process to make sure it's as effective as possible. Right. So, Oksana, it's important to boost immunity, uh, not only for the vulnerable but also for those, because as this spreads, more and more people will be exposed to it, and therefore the possibility of long COVID hitting people is going to grow. The chances of, of getting it is going to grow, isn't it? Well, we, we still have a lot to learn about long COVID, and there is um, a lot of work to be done, even within the medical community, around um, recognizing and treating long COVID. Certainly, we hope that... Uh, with the uh, improved vaccines that we'll see that this could be the next step in terms of reducing the burden of long COVID. But I think that there's a lot of investment that's needed around this because even with mild cases, those who are fit, young and healthy um, have developed long COVID and um, in, in they do not fall into those risk groups of the most vulnerable. So uh, I, I think, you know, we're a long ways away from actually understanding how to prevent long COVID. Um, you know, so the best bet would be uh, to be vaccinated and to get that booster shot when it's ready. Right. And, and on the subject of vaccinations, Ishwa Gulada, uh, of course, the Global South, we had this whole issue of inequality across the Global South last time round that didn't get its fair share. Uh, what about India? What's its experience been and, and what's its position now in terms of uh, giving boosters to the population? You're talking about a vaccine? Yeah. Okay. In, uh, comparatively, if we compare ourselves with a, a Pfizer mRNA vaccine or other mRNA vaccine, Indian vaccine, which is AstraZeneca or Covishield in India, 90% of the people received Covishield. And this is found to be a better vaccine than mRNA. 
with a long, more longevity than mRNA, less uh, adverse effect than mRNA. And therefore, India is in an advantageous situation. And secondly, India can make another vaccine in short span. And now the platform is available. So if we have to tweak uh, the current vaccine with a, a new variants or sub-variants, it can be done easily. But uh, having said that, nobody is going to take vaccine now. Because uh, we have a flu vaccine, hardly 5 to 10 percent people take flu vaccine. And this is currently milder than flu. So who will take vaccine again? So even if you use advisory, people are not going to take. The third dose was taken in India by only 30 percent populations as against 75 percent population which got the two doses initially. So vaccine advisory is uh, not going to work. But what is going to work is the current system of management. Uh, there are no um, uh, severe symptoms, no severe illnesses, and Plaxovid works uh, even on this kind of uh, uh, vaccine, uh, subvariant. So when management remains the same, we have good preparedness in all the hospitals, oxygen requirement is there, everything is there, people are not going to be bothered. If uh, this is much low, low, at the lower end of ladder, you know, influenza-like you know, illnesses, influenza A and B, then RSV, respiratory sensitive virus, and then is COVID in India. So it is lowest. Nobody's bothered about COVID now. Uh, Paul Hunter, are we saying that we should be less worried about COVID and its variants, like EG.5, and we should be focusing more on the greater threat of flu, which comes every winter? Well, I think, I think it's still too early to stop worrying about COVID. Uh, I would point out that although the old vaccine may not uh, generate um, as effective sterilizing immunity to infection as, as maybe new variants would, it still provides very good protection against more severe disease. The older vaccine compared to the bivalent vaccines, weren't, there weren't that much difference in how well they protected against severe disease. So, yeah, I mean, even in the absence of a new vaccine, uh, the older traditional vaccine still has substantial value if you are at risk of more severe disease. So, um, you know, don't don't uh, decline it because it, it don't think it's the it's against the uh, circulate the EG point five. One of the problems with new vac with tracing vaccines is most of these new variants that we've seen come around and stay around for, you know, literally a matter of a couple of months before another variant. Uh, and they're all Omicron subvariants. So you know we will never be in a position that we can have a new variant like EG.5 uh, 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 and then generate a vaccine before that disappears and we've got a new variant again. So I think we, uh, but the existing vaccine still provides substantial protection against sure. uh, uh, a severe disease. Oksana, at the beginning of the programme, we talked about this issue of, of data collecting and decreased levels of testing, which I guess it makes it harder to accurately uh, track new COVID-19 cases and, and give us the, the quantity of knowledge that we need. Is, is that the case? And how serious a problem is that? Yeah, so the World Health Organization has urgently called for governments to maintain their vigilance around monitoring and surveillance so that um, we can be prepared uh, not only for SARS-CoV-2 and all the subvariants, uh, but a future pandemic. So this is also a really important part of uh, pandemic security and is something that the WHO is discussing in their pa pandemic accord with member states. So I think, you know, we can't just be relying on uh, limited tools. The more information we have, uh, the better. And also just to emphasize that, of course, um, the the previous, uh, you know, any vaccine is better than no vaccine if you are vulnerable. Um, but now that the, the, the wild strain is no longer in, in circulation, uh, it does make sense going forward to have just a broad stroke uh, Omicron uh, focused a vaccine. So hopefully we do see that and hopefully we see countries taking um, this seriously in terms of uh, monitoring and surveillance because um, there'll be uh, there's still a lot that we have to learn, particularly the long COVID burden and the additional complications to health that will be very costly for societies. Ishwa, the WHO says it's a mistake for governments to think that COVID is a thing of the past. Are governments around the world, do you think, ready for a major increase in infections as winter approaches? 
I am a believer of the fact that there is a better pandemic preparedness than any time before, at least in last hundred years. So, and we have been vying for those two things: pandemic preparedness or emergency preparedness, and uh, whether it's a man-made catastrophe or any uh, disease pandemics. And secondly, there should be global health security, which is very weak in this world currently. If you have seen earlier when the vaccines came, all rich countries they acquired five to seven times more number of vaccines than their population. They were not least bothered about rest of the world. And it's only India which thought of everywhere that uh, poorer people, uh, low and middle income countries, they should get vaccine. So that global health security, I think WHO's main agenda should be global health security. They should penalize those countries which are doing against global health security. They are only self-centered, only for their own country, only for their own people or voters. And that is a wrong policy. So if we uh, harp on these two things, a pandemic preparedness and global health security, I think we have on all kind of battles. Yeah, so Paul Hunter, COVID not going away, flu continues to evolve uh, annually every year. Uh, we need to, to focus on the threat of, you know, com threats coming from elsewhere, different viruses emerging. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've been, um, I graduated just over 40 years ago and every year since I graduated in medicine, there has been one or more new infections, emerging infections, emerging infectious diseases. And, and that's largely what I've been studying for uh, most of the last 20 years. I think the thing about pandemic preparedness, and we've seen this in, with influenza pandemic preparedness in the past, most governments, most countries, most institutions are really well prepared for the next pandemic a year or two after the last one. And, by the and the problem is keeping that momentum. Uh, so, you know, we're always, when we used to vaccinate, when I was involved uh, in running a vaccination campaign for the uh, healthcare staff, it was always easier to get people to be vaccinated after a, the year after a bad flu than in the year before a bad flu season. And, and that's how do we do that? How do we keep public health resources and attention going at a time when you know many of the major pandemics like this won't occur in most governments' life lifespans, and that I think is the challenge. Interesting. Well, thank you, guests, to all of you for your opinions and uh, value judgments about all of this. Paul Hunt, Oksana Bijak, and Dr. Ishwar Gelada. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks too for watching. You can see the program again at any time by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the entire team, goodbye for now.